Now we are on to the 2020 road. Who are you going to step out on this road with to lead and guide you? God is not limited by time, by years. He writes over time and years and seasons. He has gone ahead. He has seen what lies on the way because he knows the way. If you step out without God this year, you are on your own. And sincerely speaking, don't blame anyone when you encounter Philistines on the way. Good morning all. I want to use this opportunity to thank the Lord and thank the Board of Elders and the Pastor, most especially the Reverend, for granting me this opportunity to share God's word with his people. It's my prayer and desire that his word that will come forth through me will go out to you in a mighty way and our lives will never remain the same. Amen. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. Your widows in the fire and the flood you're faithful forever. You are perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are faithful forever. You are perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. A father, a prayer and desire this morning is that you will help us, that faithful redeemer, your word that will come forth, that heavenly father, it will bring every stronghold, that your word, heavenly father, will bring light to the places that have been dark, that it will be your source of strength, heavenly father, for your people. Answer our prayers this morning, because we pray all of this with thanksgiving, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's open our text. The book of Zechariah, chapter 4, Zechariah 4, verses 7 to 14. Zechariah, chapter 4, verses 7 to 14. If found, I read. What are you, O mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone. To shouts of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel has laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you would know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who despises the day of small things? Men will choose, will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. These seven eyes are the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the earth. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again, I asked him, what are these two olive, tree, olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? 13. He replied, Do you not know what these are? No, my Lord, I said. Verses 14 and the last verse. So he said, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. We'll be looking at the topic titled, Dismayed but Delighted. Dismayed but delighted. If you have been following through, this is a continuation from where the associate pastor started last week. And his topic was the dynamic situation of life, which was taken from the book of Zechariah, chapter 4, verses 3 to 6. And now build on that, God's willing. 
What does it mean to be dismayed? To be dismayed is to have a sudden or complete loss of courage and fameness in the face of trouble or danger, overwhelming and disabling terror, a sinking of the spirit. That is what dismayed means. And to be delighted or to be delighted is to be greatly pleased, filled with power, wonder, and light. Dismayed but delighted. A story was, was told of a man who had the interest of his family, his welfare, and would go extra mile to see that they are full of delight. This man is said to be so emotional to the point that when he is watching a movie with his family, he shed tears. But because he knows that the act will demoralize the morale of his children, instead of him to completely stop buying or renting the movie, he would instead go to the film shop and watch the movie in advance. And you know what that means. It therefore means that he will exhibit all of his emotional prowess there before the movie gets home. And when the family, as usual, gather to see the movie, the man who is always dismayed by the scenery of this movie is a changed man now. Instead of crying, he is laughing with the family. Nobody asked him of his sudden change or attitude to movie scenes. So to them, he has decided to flow in watching the movie with them. Although the man is dismayed by the scenery of the movie, on the other hand, he is but full of delight because the unity and the welfare of his family is the utmost priority to him. Which means he, gets, he got out of his way to becoming what he was not for the sake of his family. And this story can also be equated to the children of Israelites. You remember that it was a disobedience that the parents and they committed that took them away from the promised land to the land of captivity, to the land of the Babylonians, and up to the time of the, uh, of the patia, patience. But still God in his infinite mercy went extra mile to see that they are brought back to the land he has promised through the patriarchs, which was through Abraham. In the words of Charles um, Stanley, God's guidance is of no use if you won't obey. God has a plan for us. His plan is not easy, but always the best. Sometimes you need to climb the mountains or to go through the valleys. The story also can be equated of this man, of a merchant. The face that is on his face, though dismayed by the customer extreme bargain, he bargain, bargain, bargain. But on the other hand, he is delighted with the quality of the merchandise he has sold to the customer. Praise the Lord. This is the fifth vision out of the eight that was given to the prophet Zechariah by God in one night. As with the first four visions, this vision can said to be of victory, strength, delight, Continuous trust in the Lord. And again we can add that this is also a vision of rebuke to the children of Israelites. Nearly 20 years after returning from the Babylonian exile in the time of Cyrus, God's people were discouraged. The foundation of the temple has been laid shortly after the initial return, which according to historians, it was around 536 B.C. When the foundation of the temple was laid in, the year, in that year, the younger men shouted for joy while the older men wept. We can see that from Ezra, chapter 3, verses 8 to 13. But it's, it doesn't take long for the zeal to, to call and God's people to grow apathetic, especially when opposition began an ominous growl that soon became a roar. The shout awakened the enemies of the Jews, aroused official opposition, and caused the work to stop. 
we can see that from Ezra, chapter 4, verses 1 to 6, and verses 24. And the temple laid unfinished from 536 to 520 BC, when Haggai and, and Zechariah brought God's message to Zerubbabel and Joshua. There was little evidence of the kind of spiritual renewal that the earlier prophets have anticipated. To them, we are coming into a land that was already set. To them, we are going to into a land because prophecies have been made, because, because oracles have been altered, that I am going to take you away when you disobey, and I'll bring you back and settle you. To them, they feel it was a time for them to fold their arms and not go to work. A moral reformation of the people had not occurred. Jerusalem was still only partially rebuilt and no significance am among them. There was no significance among the surrounding nations. Under the circumstance, many people completed that theirs was a day of small thing in which God was absent in his people, from his people. Many viewed faithful obedience as useless. It seemed to make more sense to fight God and to pursue the best life possible. This might be said of us today, the life that we live, and the way we view God's, God's things. We, to us, obedience is useless. Why will I obey when I can go my way to getting what I want? But in spite of all of these happenings, there was a few people who were not dismayed but were delighted in the promise of the Lord. Their hope was found in the prophecies that precede the post exilic era through the mouth of different prophets such as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, just to mention but a few. That the house of the Lord shall be rebuilt and restored and that his people shall once again call upon his name and will find answers to their questions and fulfillment to their prayers. The Lord, through the mouth of the prophet Zechariah, was reminding them that he is aware of them being dismayed, but that they should find courage and take delight in him. Why? Because the mountain they face today shall be leveled and be no more. Praise the name of the Lord. The whole background of the book of Zechariah is best captured in the words of A.W. Tozer, who said, and I quote, An intimate God can give all of himself to each of his children. He does not distribute himself that, that each may have a part, but each one he gives all of himself as fully as there were, there were no others. It is in view of this, that we will be looking at four admonitions which made those dismayed, these people dismayed, the leaders that have been dismayed, to be delighted in this turbulent period and to encourage them to go back to work and finish rebuilding the temple. It is not just for the Israelites of that time. It's still speaking to us today. The situation that the whole world has found itself in is indeed a time there are so many people have been asking, is our God alive? Is our God alive? If you are here and do not still believe that your God is alive, today is the day that you need to change that thought from your heart. Because our God is indeed alive. The first admonition here was the word of assurance. Was the word of assurance. Let's go back to our scripture. Verse, chapter 4 of Zechariah. Verse 7, that is where we'll find. Verse 7, A. What are you, O mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? You will become level ground. What are you? Was a word of assurance. What are you? Was a word of confidence. What are you? Was a word of upliftment. That they should not look at their situation as though it will not come to an end. But they should look at the situation as though God is in it. Some people say there's a difference between ability and will. Ability, they say, is a skill or competence in doing. 
What will, on the other hand, is the act of choosing to do something. Is the act of choosing to do something. Which invariably means the exercising of ability. So when God told this, when God told Zechariah, this showed Zechariah this vision, God was not only telling Zechariah of his ability to make the mountain level, but he was also reminding him and assuring him of his willingness to bring it to fulfillment. God was telling him, yes, I can. Yes, I will. God was not just having the ability, but God was willing and ready to bring this mountain to a level. Do you believe the word of the Lord? Are you confident in the things of the Lord? Do you believe his admonition? Then, the mountains we see today shall be leveled in the name of Jesus Christ. The mountain in biblical term is usually signified with strength, power, protection. But in the aspect of the Jews from this passage, it was difficulties and defeat. With their limited resources, completing the temple must have looked to the, those Jews as impossible as moving a mountain. But God told Zerubbabel that he would, by his power, level the mountain and make it plain, praise the Lord. With assurance of God's help, the great mountain of difficulties that stands in the way of rebuilding the temple will be reduced to a plain in front of Zerubbabel. It is only those who trust in the name of the Lord that will come out victorious. A songwriter would say, for the God of the mountain is still God in the valley. When things go wrong, he will make them right. And the God of the good times is also God, the God in the bad times. The God of the day is still the God in the night. You might be facing mountains. We may be facing challenges. Do you believe that God is in need with you? Trust in him and believe in him. The question might be asked, what mountain was Zerubbabel facing? What mountain was he facing? The text does not identify who or what precisely this great mountain is, but we can say authoritatively, as in the case of every exiled people or struggling people, especially the Israelites, based on the text that we're considering, they were confronted with economic, political, and spiritual mountains. Discouragement among the people, opposition from their enemies around them, poor crops, unstable economy, and people not obeying the laws of the Lord. Problems not too different from those, those of us who are in this time and in this era of the global pandemic that we find ourselves in. Because any and every obstacle, whether economic, political, and spiritual, must yield to all surpassing power of God, Nothing, I say nothing, can stop in the way of God's purpose to restore his presence to the midst of his people. The prophet Isaiah will capture this chapter, will capture this well in Isaiah chapter 40 verses 4 to 5 when he said, every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. And the, go and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all the flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The word of the Lord also came to the prophet Haggai, who was a contemporary of Zechariah, of the assurance that he has promised his people in chapter 2 of Haggai, verses 1 to 5. On the first and the 21st day of the seventh moon, the Lord spoke his word through the prophet Haggai. He said, Now and speak to Zerubbabel, who is the son of Sheltiel and, the go and his governor of Judah. The priest, the chief priest Joshua, who is the son of Jehozadak, and the faithful few who returned from Babylon, ask them, Is anything, is anyone among the faithful few? Who saw its form, the house in its former glory? How 
how does it look to you now? Doesn't it seem like nothing to you? But now, Zerubbabel, be strong, declares the Lord. Chief priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadek, be strong. Everyone in the land, be strong, declares the Lord. Walk, because I am with you, declares the Lord of the army. When the foundation of the temple has been laid 16 years ago, some of the older men had looked back in sorrow as they remembered the glory and beauty of Solomon's temple. History has it that the, the, the temple that Solomon, that Solomon built was so, was, so magnet, was so excellent and so gigantic that every, every nation around them was so envious of that temple. Because Solomon took his time to build the temple of the Lord. Rather than ignore the problem of discouragement that was sure to come when the people contrasted the two temples, the people faced the problem head on. The restored building has nothing of splendor of Solomon's temple, but God was still God's, but it was still God's house. Built according to his plan and for his glory. Though the, the temple, the foundation that was laid was not like that of Solomon. But again, the presence and the purpose of God for his children would be accomplished. The same ministry will be performed at its altar. The same worship presented to the Lord. Time changes, but ministry goes on. Time changes when ministry goes on. Haggai didn't deny that the new temple was as nothing in comparison to Solomon's, to the, Solo, the one that Solomon has built. But that wasn't important. The important thing was that this was God's work and that they will depend on him to help them finish it. Haggai said, be strong to the governor, the high priest and the people working on the, on the, rebuild, the building. And those and those two words will be very significant to them. Be strong, the Lord is saying today. Be strong, whatever circumstance, whatever situation that we seem to be confronted with. The Lord is saying, be strong and courageous. The word be strong was not a new thing to the Jews. Why? Because the book, the Jews had the book of Deuteronomy read to them. So they had the record of these three times Moses told Joshua and the people to be strong, to be strong. No doubt, they also remembered that three times the Lord told Joshua, be strong when Joshua was about to go and conquer the land of Jericho. And when King David charged Solomon with the task of rebuilding the original temple, three times he told his son, be strong, be strong. Be strong wasn't an empty phrase. It was an important part of their own Jewish history. It's one thing to tell the people to be strong and walk, and quite something else to give them a solid foundation for those words of encouragement. Haggai told them why they should be strong and walk. Because the Lord was with them. The Lord was with them. We can just picture ourselves. We are so confident sitting on those chairs. We are so, full, we are so, we are so bold enough to sit on those chairs. Why? Because we know that the manufacturer of this chair will not give us anything substandard. So it therefore means that no matter how heavy I am, no matter how, how huge I seem to be, when I sit, the chair will not break with me. That is the confidence we give on man. How about God? Who created you and I. He's telling you to be strong and courageous. If we exert so much confidence in the chair that we are set upon not to break with us, how much more of our God, who is the owner and maker of the manufacturer of the chair? Paul was in prison with no hope of release when he wrote, Rejoice in the Lord always. His circumstance didn't dictate his joy. His focus did. And the same goes for you. 
our circumstance should not make us to run away from the presence of the Lord, but rather our circumstance should keep us focused on Him, should make us steadfast in Him, because we know it is only those who depend on the Lord that shall be victorious. The second point is the word of victory, which is found from verses um, 7b to 9, the word of victory. Then he, he will bring out the top, the capstone to shout of God bless it, God bless it. Then the word of the Lord came to me. The hands of Zerubbabel has laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. Then you will know that the Almighty has sent me to you. The word of the Lord is a constant reminder to the believer that we are not fighting for victory, we are fighting from victory. The war has been won. The war has been won and indeed it therefore means that the victory is ours because our God has won the victory for us. Zerubbabel stayed, stayed, started the work and he will finish it. God reminds Zerubbabel that he will complete the rebuilding of the temple. And the people will rejoice with what God has done. Zerubbabel will bring out the top stone, the capstone, the last stone to be placed in the building with shouts of God bless it, God bless it. God gave a clear promise that Zerubbabel will complete the temple, which means, which reminds us of God's promise in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6. Be confident of this very thing. That he who began a good work in you will bring it to the day of Jesus Christ. It also echoes what David's word to his son Solomon. Be strong and of good courage and do it. Do not fear nor be dismayed. For the Lord God, my God, will be with you. He will not leave you nor forsake you until you have finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. First Chronicle chapter 28, verse 20. This was the promise. This was, this, 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 was, this was the assurance that kept me going throughout my training and throughout my stay in the seminary. The Lord has been faithful. The Lord has been just. He, he has promised never to leave nor forsake me. So that is the confidence. I remember during the orientation when we, when we were reminded by the day registrar when he came for his own path, he reminded us that if any of you seated down here is not having a sponsor, then you might do well to drop. And when he spoke that, he was speaking to me directly. Well, I didn't drop. I refused to drop. Why? Because I know the Lord that called me. I know that he will do it for me. Because the Lord has spoken. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it for you. I am here. I'm still here. Though things are not palatable, but he has remained faithful. And I believe, I have confidence that you will take me to the end. Just be strong and courageous is the word each and every day that I remind myself. When God speaks to us by his word, there is only one acceptable response. That is obedience. We don't weigh the options. We don't examine the alternatives. And we don't negotiate the terms. We simply do what God tells us to do. And leave the rest with him. Faith is not believing in spite of evidence. Said the British preacher, Geoffrey Kennedy. It's obeying in spite of consequences. So it's not because of the obedience. It's not because of the evidence that we are too much or full of faith and too much strength that the Lord will help us. But it's because that in spite of the consequences, the Lord will surely see us through. Praise the Lord. The word of caution is the third, is the third admission, admonition. The word of caution. And we find that in verses 10. A. Who despise the day of small things? Was the question. Who despise the day? Who dare despise the day of small things? The building began under Zerubbabel will challenge those who think of these, of their times as a day of small things. 
It is easy to be discouraged and dismayed with the meager resources and results that comes our way, most especially during Zerubbabel's day, the people of Judah were discouraged at the laying of the foundation of the second temple and also at the rebuilding in Haggai's day. To some of the Jews, the project was but a small thing. In comparison to the grand temple that Solomon built, but we must look at God's work through his eyes and not through the eyes of the people of the world. Great oaks, they say, grow out of small accounts and great harvest from small seeds. When the Messiah came to earth, he was but a shoot from the lump of Jesse and was despised and rejected of men. The church began with 120 people and today ministers all around the world. Bible history is the record of God using small things to fulfill his purpose. When God wanted to set the plan of, plan of salvation in motion, he started with a little boy named Isaac. When he wanted to throw Egypt, to overthrow Egypt and set his people free, he used a small baby's tears, which was Moses. From Exodus chapter 2. He used a shepherd boy and a sling to defeat a giant and a little child's lunch to feed a multitude. He delivered the apostle Paul from death by using a basket and a rope. What a mighty God. The prophet Haggai will also bring his words of caution for carefree lives that the Israelites lived when they came back from the exile in, uh, in, in chapter 1, verses 2 to 11. This is what the Almighty says. This, this, the, this people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's building to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for, for you yourself to be living in your panel houses? while the house remains a ruin? Now, this is what the Almighty says. Give careful thoughts to your ways. You have planted much, but have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are all not warm. You earn wages, only to put them in a purse with hole in it. This is what the Almighty says. Give careful thoughts to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timbers and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expect much, but see, it turned out to be little. But you brought, what you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruined while each of you is busy with his own house. Therefore, because, you, because, you, because of you, the heavens have withdrew their dew, and the earth is crops. I call for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, and the oil, and whatever the ground produces, on men and cattle, and on the labor of your hands. Haggai's second admonition invited the people to examine their lifestyle and action in the light of the covenant God made with them before the nation entered the land of Canaan. That was why the, word, the, the Lord reminded them, give careful thought. Give careful thought to your acts and action. Give careful thoughts to the way that you seem to be walking. Give careful thought to the things that you are planning to do. Give careful thoughts to the way you speak. Why? Because whatever you do, be held, you will be held responsible. It was time for the people to do serious examination before the Lord. When someone tells you, give careful thought, consider, it is a time, it is a point for you to sit down and think and really think deep on why the person asks you to consider. 
Like in, in house, it will be, to, it will be said, Hatara, when someone tells you that, it therefore means that you must sit down and really ask yourself, why, must that, why did that person ask me, to, told me that particular thing? It was a time for self-examination. The people of God must self-examine themselves. You must ask yourself, I must ask myself, what and why am I doing what I'm, what I'm into right now? God's covenant started, stated clearly that he will bless them if they obey his law and discipline them if they disobey. If you do not obey me, then I will punish you 70 times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like brass. And your strength shall be spent in vain. Why? For your land shall not yield its produce nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. You can see that in Leviticus chapter 28, 26, verses 18 to 20. Indeed, their strength was spent in vain. They sowed abundantly, but reaped a meager harvest. When they ate and drank, they weren't filled or satisfied. Their clothing didn't keep them warm, and their income didn't cover their expenses. As supplies become scarcer, price got higher, and a shopper might as well have carried his wealth in a wallet, but the wallet is filled with hole. It is one thing for the Lord to speak and another to believe what he has spoken. What has the Lord said pertaining you and I? What has the Lord told you? Are you obedient? Do you believe in it? Or are you still doubt in doubt? Because the Jews returned to the land in obedience to the Lord. They told that he would give them special blessings because of their sacrifices. But they were disappointed. Instead, the Lord called for a drought and withheld both the dew and the rain. He took his blessing away from the men who labored in the fields, vineyards, and or um, or orchids. In verse 11, Haggai named the basic products that the people needed to survive, which was water, grain, wine, and oil. Water, grain, wine, and oil was the basic thing that every humanity needs to survive with. And this was, the part, this was the same thing that the Lord took away from them. Once more, the people revealed the source of their problem. The people were busy building their own houses and had no time for the house of the Lord. The people were terribly inconsistent. They wasted time to build the house. They wasted time to build the house of God. But it was time to build their own houses. And some of the people had had built not just ordinary dwellings, but paneled houses. The kind that was built for the kings. They did not just build ordinary houses, but they built paneled houses. They built luxurious houses. They built mansions for themselves and left the house of the Lord in ruins. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all things, is it food? Is it clothing? Is it shelter? Shall be added to you. That is God's promise to Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Haggai congregation had never had that great promise, but the principle behind Christ's word were written in their law. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruit of all your increase, so your balm will be filled with plenty and your vast will overflow with new wine. Proverbs 3, 9 to 10. It is obvious that the nation had its priority confused, but, as, but are God's people today different from the ancient Jews? Is the question that we ask ourselves. They lost their priority. Can it, said, can it also be said, of, can it be said that the children of God know their priority and they set their priority right today? The answer is no. Local churches can expand their budget for evangelism, the welfare of the needy among them, the upkeep of their pastors and spiritual leaders, etc. Because the money isn't there. And yet, many church members don't believe 
what the Lord has said in Matthew 6, 33, and put God first in their giving. History has it that when the Babylonian army set fire to the temple, this destroyed the great timber that helped to hold the massive stonework together. The stone were still usable, but the interior work, but the interior woodwork had been dem demolished and burned and had to be replaced. According to Ezra chapter 3, verse 7, the Jews purchased wood from Tar and Sidon, just as Solomon has done when the original temple, with the original temple. Now, with the original temple. Now Haggai commanded the people to go into the forest on the mountain and cut down timber to be used for repairing and rebuilding the temple. What happened to the original supply of wood is what we'll ask ourselves. Did the people use it for themselves? Oh, yes, because they built their houses with panel wood. Did people, did, did clever entrepreneurs profit by selling wood that has been brought with the king's grant? We don't know, but we wonder where the people got the wood for their panel houses when no wood was available for God's house. A minister was giving an account of his ordeal. He said, during nearly 50 years of ministry, I've noted that some professed Christians buy the best for themselves and give the Lord whatever is left out. One out furniture is given to the church and one out clothing is sent to the missionaries. Like the priest in Malachi's day, we will bring the Lord, like the priest in Malachi's day, we will bring to the Lord gifts would be embarrassed to give our family and friends. You will bring to the house of the Lord gifts that even even the least of your siblings or the least, if there's anything like that, in the eyes of the Lord, there's nobody least. But let's just use that example. The least of the person in your family, you will not like to give that clothing. But that is the same thing that you bring to the house of the Lord. But when we do this, we commit two sins, the preacher will say. We displease the Lord and we disgrace his name. The Lord told the people through Haggai, build the houses. So that I may build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored. God delight in the obedient service of his people and his name is glorified when we sacrifice for him and serve him. Hallowed be thy name is the first petition in the Lord's prayer. But it's often the last thing we think about as we seek to serve God. Jesus said, I do Always those things that pleases the Father. And that's a good example for us to follow. Let your, light so sh let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and give the glory to your Father in heaven. He certainly didn't please God or honor his name when the people neglected God's house and built elaborate houses for themselves. We know that God doesn't live in temple built by hands. And that our God, our, our church buildings are not his holy habitation. But the way we care for those buildings reflects our spiritual priorities and our love for him. Whereas the house of the Lord today is no longer material but spiritual, the material is still a very symbol of the spiritual. When the church of God in any place, in any locality, is careless about the material place of assembly, the place of its worship and its work. It is a sign and evidence that it's a life at a low residing tide. We must take caution. It was a word of caution to them. For those who think that it was not time for them to serve the Lord, for those that think it was not time for me to do what God requires me to do. No, I do not have house. Why should I go and do, be, why should I be busy building the house of the Lord while my house is in reunion? Seek first the kingdom of God and everything shall be added unto you. Is the, is the promise 
and the promise has not yet changed, the promise is still there. The question in the verse we are considering, which is Zechariah 4, 10a, reminds us not to judge God's work by human standard. Do not judge God by human standard. Reason that being that even those skeptics will be brought to rejoice over God's faithfulness. Amen. God's work may start in small ways, but our confidence is that it will reach a glorious conclusion. Never despise the day of small things, for God is glorifying small things and uses them to accomplish great things. A word of caution. The fourth point, and the last, is a word of presence, the word of his presence. And we can find that from verses, verses 10 down, but we'll consider verses 10b. God, men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hands of Zerubbabel. These seven are, these seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the earth. The word of his presence. The word of his presence. Remember, the Lord grant them assurance. The word of assurance, the Lord grant them the word of his victory. The Lord grant them the word of caution. And now the Lord is telling them, I will be with you, which is the word of presence, of his presence. God and his servants must work together to accomplish his purpose. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Like Paul will say in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. God supplies his servant with the spirit, and the people are encouraged as they see Zerubbabel on the job with the plumb line in his hands, measuring, making sure the walls are stressed. Zerubbabel is walking, the eyes of the Lord are watching over his people and monitoring the nations of the earth. That was where the phrase, those seven in Zechariah chapter 4, verses 10. And again, we can refer it back to um, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 9. The eyes of the Lord, meaning his omnipotence. The Lord is with us wherever we seem to be. The Lord is always with his children. Nothing can be hidden from the presence of the Lord. The Lord is reminding us of his presence. His watchful eyes over the whole earth. The interest of his restored people, which results on blessing for his people. The temple that is being built by Zerubbabel will serve as the foundation of a new relationship between the Lord and his people. The Lord's favor towards his people is eternal and his blessing inexhaustible. God is sovereign over all the affairs of his people. Amen. God is sovereign over all the affairs of his people. And again, the prophet Isaiah will capture this in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 15, 23 and 24. Behold, the nations are like, are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the doors on the scale. Behold, he takes up the coastline like fine dust. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundation of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads, out, who, and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. Who brings princes to nothing and makes the ruler of the earth as emptiness? Similarly, the, Lord, the title, the Lord of hosts, showed that all the power of the cosmos at, at his disposal. The Lord of all the hosts. He is the Lord of all the hosts. Like Paul will, remind, will tell his audience, the God of the nations are idols. While our God is the living God, whatever thing you seem to have, whatever protection you seem to have, the Lord is telling you that he's He's, he's at the disposal of all the earth. He watches us because he's the Lord of hosts. So where can you run from him? Where can you go? The Lord is telling us this morning that we must hold on to him. We must depend on him in whatever situation we find ourselves in. 
The promise of God's presence was an encouragement to both Joshua and Solomon. Believers today can claim the same promise as they, as they serve the Lord. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Never will I leave you nor forsake you is the word of the Lord for us to, for us to die. We can also acclaim the promise of God's presence to the prophet Haggai for the rebuilding of the temple. The promise of God's presence with his people is guaranteed by his unchanging word in Haggai chapter, um, verses, in Haggai chapter 2 verses 5. This is the promise I've made to you when you came out of Egypt. My spirit remains with you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. When the tabernacle was dedicated by Moses, God's presence moved in. For the, pro for the Lord had promised to dwell with his people. Then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord your God who brought them out of Egypt so that I will dwell among them. The same Holy Spirit who enabled Moses and the elders to lead the people will enable the Jews to finish rebuilding the temple. The prophet Zechariah, who ministered with Haggai, also emphasized the importance of trusting the Holy Spirit for enabling, enabling needed, enablement needed to do God's work. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, said the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4 says. Toza will say again, if God were to take the Holy Spirit out of this world, much of what we are doing in our churches will go right on. Why? Because nobody will know the difference. But because the Holy Spirit is with us, when we do things that are not according to his will, he rebukes us, he corrects us, he brings us back on track. Because that is the work of the Holy Spirit which is in us. In conclusion, during seasons of adversity, remember you are a champion, not a victim. Invest your words and energy into creating new relationships and a strong communion with the Lord. Stay awake. Stay alert. Be aware. Be productive and focused. Exude faith and expect your faith to be supernaturally honored by God who promised to intervene when you need him the most. Don't just, seek, don't just speak to God about your mountain. Don't just speak to God about your mountain. Speak to your mountain using God's word. When you make God's word your word, your mountain will be moved. In the words of Charles Pogeon, if we cannot believe God when circumstances seem to be against us, we do not believe him at all. When you refuse to believe God in the era of COVID-19, it therefore means that you never had believed him in the first place. We, we do not care about the statistic. What we care about and all what we know is that this too shall pass. That is our confidence. Believe in him. Depend on him. Hold on to him. And he will surely bring us out of this circumstance. Have faith. When others are saying there is a casting down, we will not use our same mouth to say the same thing. But rather, the word of the Lord admonishes us to say, there is a lifting up. There is a lifting up. There is a lifting up. Just as the Lord assured Zerubbabel of making plain the mountain which they were confronted with, the Lord is assuring us, the Lord is giving us such assurance that the pandemic we are faced with today will be no more. It shall be a plain, it shall be made plain in Jesus' name. Never forget the word of assurance, the word of victory, the word of caution, and ultimately, the, pre the promise of his presence. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Let's bow, our, let's bow our heads as we pray. Just appreciate God for today. Thank him for his word today. Dismayed but delighted. 
Can you ask the Lord for forgiveness in ways that you've been dismayed and you belittle him that he will never help you in this situation? You belittle the power of the Lord. Can you ask for forgiveness? That Father, you help me. Take away the heart of, of, of me being dismayed and give me the heart of delight. Because I know you promise that you will be us. You promise us. You've given us assurance. You've cautioned us not to go back the ways of the world. And you've given us victory. Just appreciate the name of the Lord. Tell him to forgive you of all your sins. Father, we just thank you. We exalt your name. We magnify your name. Take glory today. Take glory always. And be in us be with us the rest of the day and for the whole of our lives on earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Behold.